Okay, we are ready. Good morning. My name is Lee Lasher and I am the president of Jewish Federation of Northern New Jersey. Well, we are gathered together in our homes, waiting for this informative and enlightening program to begin. Jason Shamas, our CEO is in Poland, seeing firsthand the needs, desperation, and hope of the incoming refugees crossing the border. Over 10 million Ukrainians have been displaced because of this Russian aggression and 2 million refugees alone have come to Poland. That is twice the entire population of Bergen County. Think about that. Jason has witnessed the incredible irony of seeing the best and the worst of humanity. He has seen the extraordinary way the Jewish community and Jewish organizations have coordinated their efforts to provide support, assistance, and aid to people who have literally left everything behind to find safety. As the president of Federation, I am so proud of the work we do, which is especially obvious during a crisis like the war in Ukraine. It is abundantly clear, and I hope to you also, that you can trust that a gift to Federation will truly make an impact. Jason was on CBS 11 p.m. local news last night, and will be conducting another press conference today at 4.30 p.m. Please go to jfnnj.org slash today, and it will take you right to the Zoom link for Jason's press conference. And now it is my pleasure to be hosting today's program featuring Herb Kennan, a senior contributing editor and columnist at the Jerusalem Post. Herb not only has decades of experience covering issues important to the Jewish world and Israel, but is also a friend of the Northern New Jersey Jewish community. This is not the first time Herb has agreed to share his insights with us. Herb has been at the Post for 36 years, 20 of those as its diplomatic correspondent. And during that time, he has covered up close the major stories that have shaped the nation for more than three decades. Lee, I think there's something with your mic. Um, it sounds fuzzy if there's something people are commenting. Okay, I'll keep trying. From the first intifada to the withdrawal from Gaza, the massive immigration of Soviet Jews to the Rabin assassination and the Ariel Sharon premiership to that of Benjamin Netanyahu and now Prime Minister Bennett. He has traveled extensively with Israel's prime ministers on their trips around the world and has interviewed dozens of Israeli and world politicians, statesmen, and decision makers. In addition, Herb also writes a popular monthly light column on daily life in Israel. A collection of these columns, French Fries in Pita, was published a few years ago and is available on Amazon. Originally from Denver, Herb has a BA in political science from the University of Colorado Boulder and an MA in journalism from the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana. He has lived in Israel for 37 years and lives with his family outside of Jerusalem. Herb, welcome, and I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, thank you, Lee, thanks, uh, th thanks for inviting me. Uh, let me just, just kind of frame uh, what, what I, I think we're gonna be talking about. It's, I, I think we can say, I think an apt way to say what Israel is, how Israel's look at the crisis is it's kind of trying to walk through the rain without getting wet. And I don't mean to be flipped by that, but I think it adequately describes the situation. On the one hand, Israel is clearly, clearly with the democratic West. It's with Ukraine. It abhors the Russian invasion. It's sickened by the death and the devastation. On the other hand, Israel essentially has a border with Russia. Uh, we're kind of like a Baltic state to a certain degree, like Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, they all border Russia. We have a border with Russia, it's called Syria. Uh, Russia controls the Syrian skies. The Syrian skies are extremely, extremely important for us. Israel's policy towards the whole crisis, I think is best summed up as kind of being a high wire acrobatic act 
We're trying to balance principles on the one hand and interests on the other, right? Doing right by the Ukrainians, doing the right thing with the Ukrainians without inciting Moscow's anger an anger that could trigger Russian actions that might significantly harm our real security interest. Uh, what does that mean? It means, like I said, the Russians, they hold the, 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 the keys to the Syrian skies. Um, those skies are extremely, extremely important for us to keep the Iranians from moving into Syria and turning Syria into a forward base for action against Israel kind of a, a southern Lebanon on steroids. So, so we really do have interest there that we have to take into consideration when, when trying to balance this whole thing. I mean, just you know, two weeks ago, Israel hit or reportedly hit uh, Iranian acid outside of Damascus, killing two, uh, two uh, Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corp uh, officials or officers. And that stuff is, is critical. Israel sees that as critical in keeping the country safe. Were Russia to shut down its skies to us, were to shut down Syria's skies to Israel, it would be it would be an extremely complicated situation. So again, that's the that's the balancing act that we're trying to do: um, principles versus interests. You know, a, a moral purist will say, "Well, hey, you know, in, uh, principles should always trump interests." Uh, and that's right, you know, theoretically, however, when you're dealing with real life situations, you have a real country to secure, it's a little more messy, it's a little more complicated. Let me just say one, one last thing, though, about, about Israel's role in this. And it's kind of a, astounding and even astonishing if you put it into, into historical context, that Israel's kind of being thrust into a situation where it's, it's one of the few parties in the world that can actually maybe mediate or is serving as some kind of mediator between Putin and Moscow and Zelensky and Kiev, right? I mean, I mean you know, think about it, right? I mean, it's, it's not other countries, other world powers coming to us to uh, mediate our crisis, but rather it's, it's them calling on us to go and mediate their crisis. Uh, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was astounding, remarkable. You know, two weeks ago when Bennett on Shabbat, he flew off to Moscow, and then after uh, Motzei Shabbat, after Shabbat went out, he flew immediately to Berlin. You know, Israel was 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 the was the, the corridor. Israel was the you know the mediator between talks between Moscow and Berlin. Put that in an historical context, and it's and it's astounding. It shows the it shows the distance that the country has traveled. Um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, Amnesty International came out with this report saying that Israel is an apartheid state. That was one of the numerous reports coming out by, by human rights NGOs over the last couple of, uh, a couple of years. And the goal of those reports is to cast Israel as a pariah state. Well, you know what? We're not, we're not much of a pariah state when the world is coming to you to try to get you to mediate a conflict. I think, again, I think that shows the distance to which Israel has traveled over the last few decades. Um, one last thing on that note, also astounding if you put it into kind of historical context, when the war first broke on February 24th, a couple of days later, there was a, a vote condemning Russia and the Security Council. One of the temporary members of the, of the Security Council is the UAE, the United Arab Emirates. They abstained on it, angering the Americans. Uh, the Americans then took this resolution, they brought it to the General Assembly, and what you saw was something incredible. Washington turned to Jerusalem to lobby Dubai to get them to vote with them on this, on this, uh, on this resolution, right? But again, you have to, you know, you put that in the context of, of where Israel is as far as its position in the world and, 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 and how things have changed so radically. And I think that that gives you a, a pretty good indication. You can go, we can go into the whole discussion about whether it's smart for Israel to mediate or not smart for Israel to mediate. But the very fact that we're there, I think, says a lot, a lot about where Israel is. Yeah, I kind of want that's exactly where I wanted to go and unpack that a little bit to start, you know, this historical context. And, and it is fast, fascinating and really, I think, uplifting to see, you know, the state of Israel um, being such an important bridge. Uh, it, between Russia and Ukraine and, and potentially mediating things. Uh, first of all, um, I do want to ask you, what do you think of Bennett's media, mediation effort so far? Um, or do you have any insights or, uh, about what specifically he's talking to Putin about or what he's trying to c 
convince Putin if there's such a thing that could be done. And you, you just mentioned before, I would ask also, is, it, is this good or bad for Israel that we're in this position? Look, I mean, like everything else um, in Israel, like, I mean, you, you, you have pros and cons here. You have those who say that this is good for Israel. You have those who say that it's bad for Israel. Those who say it's good for Israel say like this. Say, look, this is something that, that, that increases Israel's stature on the world stage. Again, it's a, it's a counter to, to the whole attempt to make us into a pariah state. This makes us not only not a pariah state, but a, a very essential state on the world scene. Uh, it's something that's good. It's something that increases its stature. If it works out, right, it could earn uh, Bennett a Nobel Peace Prize, right? And according to this argument, if it fails, then, you know, nothing gained, nothing lost, no big deal. On the other side of the equation, you hear people saying that it is a mistake because uh, why, why does Israel, finally you have a conflict in the world that's not about us, it's not about the Jews, it's not about Israel. Why put your head into that bed, especially when the likelihood of you being able to, to, to be an effective mediator looks, if you just look at it objectively, uh, you know, relatively slim. Why do I say that? Because what does it take to mediate a conflict, right? It takes, it takes two things. It takes, it takes leverage, and it takes the ability to give security guarantees, right? Israel has no leverage over the Russians. We have no leverage over Putin. And as far as security guarantees, we can't guarantee Zelensky anything, right? What are we, we going to say? We're going to guarantee a no-fly zone. Um, so we really don't, we, we can't, you know, in the traditional classic role of, the, of what a mediator does, we don't have necessarily the tools. What can we do? Because apparently we're trusted by both sides, by both Putin and Zelensky, we can relay messages. Uh, but there's a difference between relaying messages and mediating. The problem with being a messenger is what happens if one of the sides doesn't, doesn't like the message that you relay? Then that could come back and that could actually hurt you in the long run with that country. So, look, I mean, if, 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 if Bennett actually believes that he can do something with this, that, that there is some way he, where he can go, that, that he can push Putin in a certain direction, uh, then I think it's, it's something that, you know, it's good that he's doing. But if he's just trying to show that Israel can play in the big leagues, right, uh, although that can give us some, you know, a great deal of pride, um, if, 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 if it's ineffective, then I'm not necessarily sure that it, it'll, do, it'll do much good. The other thing, Lee, if I just for a second, is uh, there's a domestic political uh, element to this as well. And that is, uh, I, I don't think this is the reason why Bennett did it, but, but he's going to get some kind of domestic bounce from this. Right? I mean, remember, Bennett is a, a weak prime minister, weak in the sense that he's only has six Knesset seats out of 120. He's been kind of hurt since the year he's been in almost what, nine months since he's been in power by, by not seeming presidential, not seeming prime ministerial. He doesn't have the gravitas. He doesn't have gravitas because he can't push things through the government because he just doesn't have the political power. Uh, what this does is it gives him a deal of gravity, a degree of gravitas, right? And Israelis like that. They like to see their leader, their leader on the world stage, you know, playing with the big boys. And he's definitely doing that. Um, we saw there was a poll. There was a poll taken last week after he started his mediation and his numbers went up. I mean, they went, I mean, he, he fell in the polls from the six seats he has now to five seats. And now he went from five to seven. That's not going to save him politically, but it just shows that he does get some, some political bounce out of this. And in the same token, look what happened yesterday. Or, or was it yesterday, two days ago, with the summit in Sharm el Sheikh, with the with the Crown Prince of uh, of Abu Dhabi and with the, with the President of Egypt? That kind of stuff helps him politically as well. Again, he didn't do it because of that. I don't think, right? I don't think that's a reason he put himself out there. Uh, but I do think that he could benefit from it. Also, it's interesting to note that it's Bennett here. Because, you know, Netanyahu, uh, the former prime minister Netanyahu, he brought Israel to a, a, a different level on the world stage. And his people were always saying, and he himself always said, well, if I'm not there, then Israel's stature will decline, right? The, 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 the kind of the idea, well, you know, the, he had a great relation. He had a great relationship with Putin. He had a great relationship with India's Modi or with the president of China. And if he were to go, then those relations would go down the, down the tubes. That didn't happen. And we've seen something interesting that the relationships are not between the country and Netanyahu. It's not the man, it's the country, right? Uh, it, it's, it's Israel. It's not, they're dealing with Israel, not necessarily Netanyahu or the leader.
Yeah, I, I certainly don't underestimate uh, Prime Minister Bennett. In fact, it reminds me, Jason Shamas and I were in Israel uh, in May, right after the, the last round of Gaza fighting. We were the first mission allowed into Israel despite COVID and having to get, I got more COVID tests that week than the entire COVID to get into Israel. <laughs> And we, we met with, uh, we were there with Eric Fingerhut, the CEO of JFNA and Mark Wilf, the president and a small delegation. And we met with Naftali Bennett. This was four days before he announced the coalition and there wasn't gonna be another vote. And he told us that, um, you know, we said another vote, how many votes are you gonna have? And, and he said, there's not gonna be another vote. I'm working on something. And, you know, we all, when he left, looked at each other and said, no way. What's he, he's got six, seven seats. What's he going to do? And he did it. So right. I'm not underestimating yeah. him. Um, let me ask you a question. Uh, President Zelensky um, spoke Sunday to the Knesset, and he made some, frankly, some disturbing remarks um, and concerning remarks that were critical of Israel, uh, that Israel wasn't doing enough for the Ukraine. Um, <laughs> is there a cause for concern? Um, is the criticism legitimate? What's the reaction in Israel? Look, it's interesting. I mean, the reaction to that speech was, uh, it, it, it was very critical. The reaction to that speech was very critical um, because not necessarily because he, because he had criticism that Israel wasn't doing enough or that Israel wasn't selling them weaponry. Um, I think there's a certain you know, understanding here that you don't judge somebody in their moment of distress. Right? I mean, the, the, the man's fighting for the, you know, for the freedom of his country, his people are being killed, he's, he's, he's going he's gonna to come out swinging, which he did. I think, I think what would hit the wrong chord here was, was when he was talking about the Holocaust uh, and making comparisons between, between the final solution and, 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 and what the Russians are trying to do with Ukraine. Uh, that, that hit the wrong chord. You don't want to come to Israel if you, if you want to get support. You don't want to come to Israel and you know, start saying that, well, what we're going through is like the Holocaust because, because the Israelis you know, see the, the Holocaust uh, legitimately as a unique event in human history. Uh, you know, the, the attempt to you know, a genocide, systematic genocide of a, of a people, that's not what we're seeing in Ukraine. But even more than that, he said something else. And I think uh, the, the, Ukraine, the Ukrainian ambassador has had, said here as well, they kind of jarred people. And he said something like, you know, remember, you know, with you, with the, the Ukrainians stood with the Jews during the Holocaust. Well, that's a, you know, that's a part of the, 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 the memory that we just don't exactly have. I mean, most Jews don't have a fond memory of where the Ukrainians were in the Holocaust. Um, there's, there's some kind of, you know, revisionist history going on here, you know, saying that there were, you know, thousands and thousands of Ukrainian righteous Gentiles. I mean, there were some. There were, there were 2,600 recognized by Yad Vashem, but, but that's a huge country, right? Um, uh, Holland had 4,600 4, righteous. I, I don't want to compare, right? But, but it, it was a mistake, I think, for him to come and say, look, we were good for you during the Holocaust. You owe it to us to be good to us now. Um, Israel should be good to, to the Ukrainians now because it's the right thing to do, but, but it's not necessarily because of the Ukrainians uh, a sterling record during the Holocaust because that record wasn't that sterling. Okay. Um, I wanted to um, ask you about the, the actual refugees, which of course, you know, the scenes that we see is just absolutely heartbreaking. <laughs> I mean, can you tell us a little bit more specifically about Israel's policy regarding the refugees? How are the refugees, uh, the Ukrainian refugees, doing in Israel so far? Um, and I'm also curious, is there any perceived tension between the Russian Jewish community in Israel and the Ukrainian Jewish community? Do they, do they see themselves as a, as a separate community? Uh, you know, it's interesting, the, the, the last part of what you say, the, the tension between the Russians and the, and the Ukrainian Jews in Israel. I haven't sensed any of that at all. I haven't picked that up either in my personal uh, in my personal relationships with people or I've seen any of that in the press. It's also interesting that Israelis call everybody who came from the former Soviet Union Russians, right? Like I have a neighbor, you know, I was, I was referred to him, you know, as my Russian neighbor. He's not Russian, he's Ukrainian. Right. Um, so we, we've we've never really made that distinction. And I, I don't I don't feel that there's any any tension between the communities here. Look, the refugee here issue here is, is, is a huge issue. It's, it's causing a lot of debate. The policy has changed. Um, and, and I think it's important. I think it's important to make a couple of distinctions. First of all, you have to you have to recognize that Israel 
is, first of all, Israel, because of its history and because so many people here were refugees, there is a sensitivity to refugees, right? There is a sensitivity to refugees. As Jews, we have a sensitivity to refugees. I also think, however, there's also a realization that with even with that sensitivity, Israel can't take in all the refugees from all the war zones in the world. Uh, the, 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 the absorption minister, uh, who is an Ethiopian immigrant, when there was one of these debates about what to do with the Ukrainians, she goes, well, why are you taking in all the refugees, or why, why should we take in all these refugees from Ukraine when we didn't take in all the refugees from the Ethiopian the war, the civil war that's going on there? Right? So, so there's a lot of debate. As far as the policy, look, Israel, you got to distinguish between two things. The refugees who have no connection to Israel, to Judaism, they're refugees who, I don't know, they, 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 they're leaving Ukraine, they're going to Poland, and for some reason they want to come to Israel. Maybe they know people here. You have to differentiate between those, and you have to differentiate between those Ukrainians who are eligible to come to Israel under the law of return. Right Under the law of return, the law of return says that anybody with one Jewish grandparent can move to Israel. You don't have to be Jewish. All you need is a Jewish grandparent. Or, or if you're married to a Jew, or married to a, a, the child of a Jew, or married to a grandchild of a Jew, right? and you have nobody, you're eligible to come to Israel. So you have 200,000 people in that category. So if those people come to Israel, should they be considered refugees? Right? When the world asks, well, what's Israel doing for the refugees? These are, are Jewish refugees or, or, or refugees who are eligible to come under the law of return, even if they're not Jewish. Um, do they count? Do they count? You know, when you look at what countries are doing, do they count? You know, I, I would argue that yes, you know, Jewish refugees are refugees too. Yes, we take them in because that's what Israel does. That's what Israel was, was founded for, you know, taking Jews in distress. But it, it should also, I think, be counted, you know, towards what we're doing for the Ukrainians. So you have a you have a pool of two hundred thousand potential uh, uh, olim who could come from Ukraine. Uh, there's talk in the media that a hundred thousand are going to come this year. It's not going to happen, right? It's not going to happen. There's a dissonance between how Israel looks at this type of thing and how the the Jews who are actually involved look at it. Like Israelis, it's 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 kind of hardwired into our DNA. The Jews are distressed anywhere in the world, and they have to flee. They're going to flee to Israel, right? That's how we like to look at ourselves. But this isn't 1940s. Jews fleeing places where they have to flee have other options right now. Um, the you know the Ukrainians who could come to Israel, they go to Poland. You know, a lot of them want to stay closer to you know close to Ukraine because they hope to go back because they've left fathers or sons or husbands or brothers fighting inside Ukraine. They don't necessarily want to come to Israel. Um, something that was kind of similar happened with, with, with the French Jewry in the last decade. Remember in the middle of last decade, you had these terrorist attacks in France and there was all this talk that Israel was gonna be gearing up for a huge Aliyah from, from France, right? There was a spike right? in 2014, 2015, you had 7,000 one year, 8,000 the next year, but they didn't come, you know, they, they, they didn't come because they had other options. A lot for every Jew who ended up going to Netanya from France, another one went to, went to London, Montreal, New York, and Miami, right? Because they had other options. So, so yeah, there is a pool of 200,000 eligible under the law of return to come here. People I speak to at the Jewish agency saying that probably 15,000 will come from Ukraine this year. And then there's another category, and those are those who, who, who are, don't have any connection to Israel, real refugees who just come knocking on our, our, our gates. Uh, the original policy uh, was a mistaken policy, I think, was, was to put a quota on it, put a quota of 5,000. Um, that didn't go over well here. We remember quotas, right? We don't remember fondly quotas. So they changed the policy. And the policy now is that anybody who has a, a first degree relative in Israel Ukrainian can come, right? Can come for a few months, get settled. We'll see what happens and, and then take it from there. Um, that 5,000 figure is for people who don't have relatives here at all. And in addition to that, there's another 20,000 uh, Ukrainians who are here without the proper permits who are, are going to be allowed to stay. Uh, so that's the policy right now. Um, again, is it enough? Is it not enough? Um, uh, who, who do you count? It, 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 it's causing it's quite, causing quite a lot of debate um, with people again. On the one hand, saying yes, as Jews we have to do more, and another saying, well, you know, we have to be realistic as, as what as how many we can take in. On the same notion, let me just say, you know, I mentioned two hundred thousand. There's two hundred thousand 
potential Olim from Ukraine. There's also 650,000 in Russia who can come into Israel under the law of return. Uh, and the thought is that there's going to be an increase in those numbers as well as Jews want to get out of Russia because they don't know what's going to be there and they want to get out before, before the Iron Curtain falls again. That's very interesting. Yeah, I don't think a lot of people thought about that. And it's true. Now that you mentioned that, I almost think potentially you might get more Jews from Russia coming than from, than from the Ukraine. Um, so the, the Jewish agency is talking about 25,000, 15,000 from Ukraine, 10,000 from Russia. Uh -huh. Interesting. In, the, in a year, this year. In this year. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, last week in synagogue, someone came over to me and, and said to me, why, why, why do we always get involved? Why are the Jews getting involved? You know, the Ukrainians hate the Jew, hated us and the Russians hated us. And I'm just curious on your thoughts. I mean, I, I don't want to tell you what I said to them. Uh, but, uh, you know, what, how do you reconcile the, you know, obviously the, the difficult history, which you referred to before and things like Bobby Yar and Holocaust and um, which we have with the Ukraine, but, and, and couple that with the sympathy that we all feel as human beings, you know, when we see all the death and destruction, how do you, what's the feeling on that? You know, it's interesting because I think, I think a lot of Jews feel that, you know, everybody has their own baggage. And, you know, Jews carry baggage with them when they look at current events. I know when I'm watching the Olympics, I'm rooting for countries who are good to the Jews, right? Um, you know, I don't want to make any comparison, God forbid. Uh, Ukraine is not, and like I said, it's, you know, we don't have a sterling history with Ukraine. You know, you hear the, you hear the names of the cities, you know, uh, Kiev, Kharkov, Lvov, Odessa. Uh, the memories aren't great. You, know, you got the Chelmensky massacres in the, in, in the 17th century. You've got the, the first pogrom in modern history was in Odessa in 1921. You've got pogroms in, in, in Ukraine between 1918, 1919. 50,000 Jews were killed in pogroms there before the Holocaust. Before the Holocaust, you got Babi Yar, you got Ivan Demanyuk. Uh, and even just a couple of years ago, in 2018, they, uh, a national hero is uh, Stefan Bandera. Uh, he was, uh, you know, a Ukrainian nationalist. He was also a Nazi collaborator who killed tens of thousands of Jews. So, so, so the, you know, our history is a bit, uh, it's, it, it's tough. Not that it's, not that it's great with the Russians either, right? But with the Ukrainians, it's tough. Actually, I interviewed Sharansky, uh, Natan Sharansky a couple of weeks ago, and he's actually, he's Ukrainian. So he has kind of an, an interesting, you know, vantage point on this whole thing. And he said something, he's got a great sense of humor in the Sharansky. Um, he said something that I'll, that I'll always remember. He said, look, just because their great, great grandfather raped my great, great grandmother doesn't mean I can't send them a hospital today. Right. Because if we go down that route, you know, we're not going to be building our future. We're just going to be trying to reconstruct the past. And that's that's not something constructive to do. He goes, look, I mean, Jews, we, we always go to Europe, right? Jews travel a lot. They go to Europe. You go to Europe. You go to the castles, medieval castles. This is Sharansky speaking. He says, Every meter of blood there is soaked in Jewish, in Jewish, in I mean, every meter is soaked in Jewish blood there from the pogroms. But because of that, you don't say, well, hey, you know, they in, in France or they in Spain, they deserve what the Nazis did to them because of what they did to us. That's not the Jewish way. The Jewish way is you have to support the Ukrainians uh, because they're fighting for the things that they're fighting in and, and they're dying for the things that they believe in. Um, so I, I think that was, you know, that was kind of an interesting take on it. Yes, we, we've got our history, but uh, but uh, you got to look at what's happening today. What, what's interesting here, though, is, you know, I, I mentioned Chelensky, or I can't even pronounce the guy's name. You know, what I'm talking about the, the, the yeah. Portland Atlas. Sharansky mentioned, so he said it's ironic. In the last thousand years, there's been two great uh, Lithuanian national heroes. One was Chemlensky because he liberated Ukraine from Poland and he was a virulent, miserable anti-Semite. And the other now is Zelensky, who happens to be a Jew. Right? It, 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 it's kind of ironic. Uh, it's also ironic that on the other side of the, the equation, you have for the first time, you know, a Russian leader for the first time in a thousand years who's not an anti-Semite, right? Uh, not only is he not an anti-Semite, but he actually has a soft place in his heart for Israel and for the Jews. Um, you know, unfortunately, the evil he's doing to the world right now far outweighs the good he's done for Israel and the Jews. But uh, but it's just, again, it's a, an interesting combination in, in history of, of where we're at. 
Yeah, Shira by the way, Sharansky's uh, sense of humor is very underrated because I still think he has the best line I ever heard when he said that, you know, most people go to the Knesset in Israel and then they end up in jail. He was the only guy that was in jail before he went to the Knesset. <laughs> Um, you know, we, we see the images of all the Israelis coming to the Ukraine, to Poland, to the border, to set up field hospitals, to set up crossings, to assist all sorts of people. Uh, I mean, where does that come from, that, that sense of volunteerism and spirit in Israelis that they've just, it seems like they just dropped everything and unmasked so many people went to help. I think a lot of it comes from, you know, the fact that they know what it's like. I mean, unfortunately, we know what it's like to have missiles falling on our cities. And so I think I think we can empathize for it, with it, you know, uh, more and more perhaps than others. And, you know, it comes from a Jewish uh, ethos as well and, and, and Jewish history. Right. I mean, uh, there's a, a big part of this population are refugees, either refugees from Europe or refugees from from uh, North African states, from, from the Arab countries. And they know what it's like to be a refugee. They know what it's like to have to flee your home. And if they can help, uh, if, if, if there's something they can do to help, I think you know they, they want to do that. So, so I think I think that's I think that's essentially where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. What do you think? What's the main lessons for Israel uh, to take away from everything in the crisis so far? Look, that, that's a, that's an interesting that's an interesting question. Uh, Look, one thing I've been reading about in, 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 the, in the Arab press is one of the main lessons that they're taking from this is that the Russian army ain't what it's supposed to be, right? That the, that the Russian military is, is performing way below par, and that that's, you know, that's something that they're going to keep in mind. Uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe they'll, they'll uh, maybe they're going to they're gonna throw their, because the U.S., you know, wants to withdraw from the Middle East because Russia is, is not appearing as strong as it, as it looks, Maybe they're going to start looking more to China. It's interesting that the Saudis just invited the Chinese president to come there, in, I think, in the beginning of May. So they, it might lead to some realignments in the Middle East. As far as Israel's, is, is what lessons we learn from it, look, I think there's, there's, there's three of them, essentially. The, 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 first one, the first one is, and I think this isn't a lesson for us, it's a lesson you know, for the world. Why isn't the world getting more involved in this thing? What are they afraid of? They're afraid of Putin using nukes, right? Um, you know, you, you don't know what he's going to do. Might he use tactical nuclear weapons? Um, so if, if, if that's your concern with Putin, who up until now has been considered kind of a rational actor, then what happens if the Iranians get nukes, right? And then they do stuff in the region, right? Not necessarily a nuke to wipe out Israel, but, you know, they, 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 they back the Houthis with, 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 or, or Hezbollah. Uh, and, but you can't take action against them because, because they have this, this nuclear umbrella. That's that. That's a scary thought. So I think I think one lesson for us is that you know the idea of the Iranians ever getting nukes, God forbid, is is, is completely you just have to get rid of that idea once and for all. A second a, a second uh, lesson that we take from this is that uh, international agreements don't mean much, right? And I think this is again this is something I think most Israelis realize. But it's something that's always on the table when we're talking about peace with the Palestinians, that this peace is going to be guaranteed by international agreements. And why does Ukraine show us that the agreements don't mean much? Because there was an agreement, the, the, the Budapest Memorandum in 1994, which got the Ukrainians to give up 1,700 nuclear weapons, uh, nuclear warheads, because they got uh, security guarantees from the Russians and the Americans. Well, you know, how, how'd that work for them? Uh, I imagine there's quite a few Ukrainians, you know, scratching their heads right now and saying, what the heck were we thinking? That's, that's nuts. So I think, I think that's a lesson. I think it's a sobering lesson for Israelis, you know, the, the understanding that, that those, those international agreements don't mean much, you know, don't, don't count on them. And the third lesson is something I think most Israelis know innately anyhow, but it's, it's, it's important to get a reminder from time to time. And that's, you ain't got nobody to rely on but yourself. Right. When push comes to shove, you're going to be standing alone, especially if you're not a NATO country. Right. I think one of the most one of the chilling things for me in the beginning of this was when, when Biden stood up and he said just up front, he said, you know, we're not going to commit you know, troops to Ukraine. Well, if they're not going to commit troops to Ukraine. Then, then why would I think they're going to commit troops to help us in Israel? Right. Uh, I'm not I'm not speaking for myself. I'm speaking, you know, is, 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 the Israeli population probably feels that way. Um, 
And I think that's important. I think that's, a, that's an important realization uh, that, that you're on your own, that you have to rely on yourself. Now, that's not something new here. That's something I think that people always understand. That's, that's, that's part of the Zionist ethos as well, right? That's, you know, uh, Israel never asked for other countries to come to our assistance. We only asked for the wherewithal to be able to defend ourselves. Uh, but it has practical implications. What are the practical implications when you come to budgets, right? Israel's, uh, the, the proportion of the budget devoted to the military in Israel has, has been going down for the last four decades. In 1981, uh, 31% of the budget was dedicated to the military, 31%, 1981, 40 years ago. This year, it's 11%. Right now, you can say, well, okay, but that's probably because the budget's gotten that much bigger, right? I mean, the economy's grown enormously. True, but so is the cost of an airplane and a tank and all this, you know, technology that you need. The idea that somehow we're, you know, we, we've kind of reached a, a good place and you don't have to continue to spend the billions and billions on military, you can you can put that money internally into health, education, and social welfare. That's a nice idea. But I think one of the lessons that some people are going to take from this is that, well, you know, you, you can't do that because it's a cold world out there. And in the end, we're going to end up standing by ourselves. Yeah, I think that last lesson is is definitely the one that resonates the most with me. And, and um, I hope Israel's is taking that very much to heart. I know they I know they will. Um, any other fur further thoughts or final thoughts? Look, um, it's. You know, the, the whole the, the whole idea of uh, again of, of of Israel's position in this, I think, is is is, is kind of you know just fascinating and how how this, this reflects on the changes in Israel that we've seen over over last you know the last two decades. This definitely is no longer your grandmother's Israel. It has nothing to offer the world. It has a lot to offer the world. The, the, the world sees it as, as a significant player. And I think that's also, you know, that's also one thing that we can take, you know, that, that we can take from this, this crisis and how we're being looked at in this crisis. And it's, it's, it, it kind of, you know, gives you a degree of uh, a Zionist pride. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. All right. Um, first of all, I apologize. I know my mic, people have told me my mic is not working. Um, so I'm sorry about that. We can blame Apple for my MacBook Air. But in any way, thank you, uh, everyone, for joining us today. Um, as Herb kind of articulated, the world is really complicated. And the issues are so entangled in history, biases, and control. Yet I feel and I know we need to do the right thing. The right thing to stand up and do so. Stand up and do so. It's been very enlightening to hear her perspective. Thank you, her very much. Greatly appreciated. It's been a thought provoking and thought interesting. Um, if you're interested in making a donation to the Federation, please go to www.jfnnj.org. A donation to Federation's annual campaign is an investment in our readiness to respond to any and all crises. And I hope you heard that part. A reminder that Jason's press conference again is today at 4.30. And I wish you all a great day. And Herb Lila Tov. Thank you. Have a good evening.